This is uh, AP2, uh, day two, uh, second semester review. Um, <clears throat> so we're looking at electric potential, electrical pot potential energy, circuits, and magnetism, all our favorite topics. Probably the more difficult topics, I think, um, for uh, this class. So you need to understand the difference between electrical potential and electrical potential energy. Um, so when we're dealing with electrical potential energy, that's the energy the particle has due to position, right? So this is where it's located, just like gravitational potential energy. Um, and so the V is the potential, right? So this, this V is the potential. So it could have potential to do something, but there's no energy there until you add the Q to it, right? <clears throat> and then you have electrical potential energy. Um, again, we got this K. We talked about that before. So this here is K, Q, Q over R. So notice electrical potential energy and electrical potential both have an R on the bottom. Remember our forces and our E fields that we talked about before had R squares. Um, that's because these ones are scalars, right? So you have to worry about being positive or negative, but you don't have to worry about the angle that it's at. Um, electrical fields, we talked a little bit about that. Um, technically, it says negative V over delta D, but really you want to look at it as the change in potential over change in, in distance. <clears throat> and we're looking at the E field, and that's for our constant E field between uh, two charged plates. So one of the things that I see is that people, you know, you have the equation V equals ED, and then you have the equation uh, V equals KQ over R, and they're not interchangeable. While these are both Vs, this one's only for a parallel plate capacitor, right? And this one's only for a point um, charge, right? And so they don't look anything alike, right? Because um, this one, the potential changes um, as you get, I mean, they both, I guess I shouldn't say they don't, they're not the same, but they're just not the same way to calculate them because this one's constant, right? If I have a parallel plate, the E field's pointing like this, and V, my equal potential lines are here. This is V1, this is V2, right? Um, but if I'm dealing with a point charge, then my equal potential lines are in a circular pattern, so that's why I have the KQ over R, and so this would be V1, V2, and V3. Um, and so <clears throat> you have a little bit of a, of a difference as, as you look at it, and then we'd have my E field pointing out like that or in, depending on the case. Okay, so don't confuse those two. Don't use the point one for the parallel one, and don't use the parallel one for the for the point one. And remember, these things are all scalars. Um, so when you're looking at the electric potential, right? If I have a positive here and I have a negative here, and I look at this point here, and maybe from the positive, so let's say this is one and this is two, and so the potential here, when I use the KQ over R equation. Let's say it comes out to be 3 volts, and then when I do the other one um, over here, number 2, um, let's say this one comes out to be negative 2 volts, then I know the potential at this point is 3 minus 2, so it's 1 volt total for the both of them um, being there, right? So it's just it's a scalar. We don't care about direction or anything like that, so that's kind of important. Um, work is a change in energy, so we now have to put a delta in front of it, right? Because before we said, you notice the difference, we had UE, or you might call it EPE, electrical potential energy, is equal to VQ, but if I put a delta, delta, delta in front of it, now it becomes work, right? Um, and work, of course, causes a change in kinetic energy, it makes it go faster, it makes it accelerate. Um, just watch your signs because it does matter if it's a positive or negative. I always say just use common sense um, <clears throat> to determine if your KE increases or decreases. So, you know, if I have a positive um, charge here and the one that I'm moving is this negative charge, if I move the negative charge this way, it wants to go that way, right? So if I move it in this direction, I'm going to increase its potential energy, right, because it's harder to keep it there, I'm going to decrease its kinetic energy, so I am doing negative work on it as it's, as it's going. So that's kind of the way you want to look at it as you're, as you're paying attention which way. My, my, my rule of thumb is if it increases in kinetic energy, I did positive work because I can't go wrong with that concept. 
So summary, positive charges always move from high potential to low potential. Negative charges always move from low potential to high potential. That doesn't mean positive, negative, negative, positive. It just means it's going to go something higher. So it could a uh, high potential to low potential could be a positive 3 to a positive 2, right? That's high and that's low comparison, right? Um, <clears throat> a positive charge experiences an accelerating force in an electric field that's in the same direction as the field because it's going to go faster, right? Because um, remember that the E field points in the direction of a positive charge. So therefore, if I stick a positive charge here and it moves in that way, it's going to increase its velocity. And therefore, if there is positive work being done on it, it's going faster, et cetera, et cetera. If I change that to a negative one and it's going this way, it doesn't want to go that way. So that means it's going to have a decrease in velocity. It's going to be negative work. For circuits, um, we have lots of different equations for circuits, but we saw some of these last year. Um, so we know that I, the electric current, just the definition is charge per time, right? That's what we have here. So it's just coulombs per second, which is the same as an amp. Um, we have Ohm, good old Ohm's law, V equals IR, electric power, which is P equals VI. But remember, that can be in all different sorts of ways. Um, so you could have P is equal to I squared R. You can also have P is equal to V squared over R. All we're doing is taking Ohm's law and sticking it in there and rearranging it to get these other equations. You should also remember that resistance is proportional to resistivity, the length, and uh, inversely proportional to area. That's our straw analogy, right? With a bigger straw, it's easier to get through. Longer straw, it's harder to get through. Rho is the um, what the thing is made out of. It's the resistivity. Um, if you're in series, you add up the resistances. If you're in parallel, you do one over. So in this case, the resistance is going up, and in this case, the resistance is going down. Remember, we talked about the fact that if you have a full gymnasium, you open more doors, resistance goes down. That's why in parallel, resistance goes down. Um, charge on a capacitor, uh, Q is equal to CV. I always do it that way because otherwise I mess it up. Um, but it's C times V. Uh, for capacitance, it's A over D. Epsilon not, is a constant, so it's proportional to the area and inversely proportional to the distance between the plates. So when we're talking about area, remember that's the area of the plate up here. And then you have another plate down here, so that would be my area. And then my distance is the distance of separation. Um, so the closer they are, the more capacitance. That makes sense because you pull them apart. Um, then it would have to have uh, less capacitance. Um, total capacitance in series, um, we played around with this. Not super successfully, but I think maybe you got the concept. Um, and so in series, now our capacitance goes down because you only get you have to split the energy, right? You split the voltage between all the okay, so if I capacitor and capacitor, capacitor, I have to split the voltage three ways. You have a little bit of there, a little bit there, a little bit there. And since Q equals uh, C V, you have less capacitance. Um, if it's in parallel though, the capacitance increases because now when you have them in parallel, I guess that doesn't really look in parallel, but if we assume that looks really funny. Um, let's try drawing that again so it actually looks like they're in parallel. So maybe we have our circuit like this and we have a capacitor there and then we have a capacitor there and we have a capacitor there. This is a battery, really, it is. And so, but the voltage is the same across each of them and since the voltage is the same, and again, we got Q equals CV, so you end up being able to add all those up. They get more voltage than you do when they're in series this way and we had one battery here that connected all of them. Um, energy stored in a capacitor is simply one half, I always remember it as one half CV squared because it's just like one half MV squared, but um, you can put in the this equation for it and you can end up with one half QV. Those are both given on the equation sheet though. Um, so, yeah. Other things to remember is the definitions and what we mean. Current is I, which is the flow of electrons. We use conventional current, which says we go from positive to negative. So if I'm looking at a circuit, this is my positive side, and this is my negative side, mm -hmm. right? And we look at it going around, then we know that the, uh, the current is going to go in this direction. It always goes from positive to negative. Um, voltage is the difference in voltage. Um, so in this case, the, my delta V would be here, right? What's the difference in voltage there? Caused by the battery, whatever it is. But that's what causes it to flow. And then R is the resistance, um, which is, if you graph it, right, if you do VI, you get a, that is not what we have. 
Let's try that again. If we graph V versus I, the slope is equal to resistance because V equals IR. So R equals V over I. Um, <clears throat> but it's only true at certain temperatures. If you get too hot, it doesn't act like an ohmic, right? This is an ohmic resistor. It looks like that, but they don't have to make Remember Kirchhoff rules, we love these, but you should understand the concept that you have conservation of energy, so the, all the voltage drops have to equal the voltage gains for any closed loop, and conservation of charge, the total current, um, is the addition to each branch. So if we have an example, and we have a battery, and then we have some resistors in here. Let's put another resistor. Let's make it a simple one. Right, so then you remember, and this is my positive, this is my negative, so then I could have one loop here, and I could have another loop here, and so I could call this R1 and R2 and R3 and call that V, and so if I did that first loop, I could say, oh, this is going, this part right here is going to increase the voltage, and then that's going to be equal to um, the voltage drops here, which are IR, so, and this is, this, there's, if we look at it, we'd have, I don't know, call this one I1 that comes mm -hmm. out, it's going to split, so we're going to have I2, and then we're going to have I3, so we say, okay, as so I go through here, that's going to be um, I1, R1 is going to lose some energy here, then we're going to lose a little energy there, so plus I2, R2. So that's going to be one of my equations because that's, that's, that's this, right, conservation of energy. Um, if I wanted to do conservation of charge, I would then say, oh, well, I know I1 has to equal I2 plus I3. That's always the easy one. Um, it's a lot of common sense. If I wanted to do one more loop, maybe this blue loop, I can do it here. Um, so I notice that in this case, I have the current all pointing upwards, right? So, but my loop, notice it's going backwards. So I know this is going to be a, a voltage gain and this is going to be a voltage loss because you have to, because a closed loop has to have zero if you add it all up. So I'd have um, I2, R2 is equal to R3, I3. I get conservation of energy. So that's the idea. Um, of course, we like the way where you just know how much it splits. So if you want to skip Kirchhoff and just understand the concept, you know that when the current splits, it's going to split in the inverse ratio between the two resistances, right? So if I added up R2 and R3, um, I would know that I'd have uh, two ratios. So if I, it's getting really messy in here. Um, if I looked at um, these two, and this over here, and I wanted to figure out how much of I1 goes through each one, then I could say R3 over R1 plus, um, not R1, R2 plus R3, because that's, that's the two here, right? So that ratio is going to go through um, resistor 2, so that's going to be equal to, and then times the total current you have, which is I1, so that would be equal to I2, and then um, the other one would be I1 times I, hello, I'm trying to do it yellow, I, I1 times R2 over R2 plus R3 is going to be equal to I3, right? So when I add these two up, it adds up to I1, right? So you can look at the inverse ratio. If you're doing it in series, it's backwards, right? Because the one with more resistance is going to end up with more, so then this would flip-flop, and you'd have the R2 and the R3 um, flip-flopped if you're looking for them in series. So different ways you can do it. Um, well, it wouldn't be for the current either, right? Okay. Back up. If you do series, right, it's the voltage that splits. If you do parallel, then it's the current that splits. But the ratio concept is still the same, okay? Um, and here's where this summarizes it, right? So in series, we know that I is the same. In parallel, we know V is the same. In series, we know we have the voltages. In parallel, we know we have the currents. Um, that's why we split, we split it, the voltages, or we split the currents in that backwards ratio or forwards ratio, right? This would be the same ratio, Right, so more, right, bigger R equals bigger voltage. And here it's the opposite ratio. I don't know if I, hopefully that makes sense. The opposite 
ratio. So if you have more R, you have less current, right, when you're splitting it up. Um, you add the resistances in series, it increases. You add the 1 over R's um, in parallel, it decreases. The interesting thing is in both cases, you just add the power. So you figure out the power from each uh, item in there, each light bulb, each resistor, and you just add them up. That's the total power for the whole circuit. Um, we talked a little bit about this already, but just the concept, power is energy per time. Um, so you can put any energy on top. In this case, we're doing um, electrical energy, so we could do IV, V squared over R, I squared over R. When you're doing capacitors um, within a system, um, it's a device that stores energy, but if it's totally discharged, that means you have this infinite flow, so R is equal to zero, or it's totally charged, and R is at infinity, and nothing goes through it. So remember we talked about the fact that if you have a circuit that looks like this, and maybe we put a capacitor in there, and then we put a resistor in there, and then maybe we put another resistor in here. Um, in the beginning, all of the current, remember, is going to fly like this, right? But then after time, it's going to skip the capacitor because that now has um, infinite resistance, and it's going to go like that. So um, you understand that concept. You don't have to worry about the in-between part. Um, and we already said this, that if you're in parallel, you have more capacitance, and if you're in series, you have less capacitance as you put them there. Um, you should understand how to hook up an ammeter and voltmeter. Um, an ammeter measures current, it has low resistance, it has to be in series. A voltmeter measures voltage, it's high voltage, it must be in parallel. So if I have a circuit and it looks like this, and I wanted to know the amount of current going through it, I have to put my ammeter in series. If I want to know the voltage, I have to put the voltage across in parallel. Right? We know that now. A whole bunch of reminders. I don't know if I want to read all these. You can read some of them, but let's just take a look. Um, we know that conventional current, we said that goes from positive to negative. Um, you assume everything's ohmic unless told otherwise. Um, you, assume, you assume that there is negligible, right, negligible resistance in wires. Um, you assume the resistance is constant unless told otherwise. Um, you assume in current that the current is the same, right? It's the same if it's in series. Um, you assume that the voltages are going to add up to the total voltage if um, you're in series. Um, in parallel, you assume the voltages that are equal. I mean, we've said all this. Um, if you add more uh, resistors in, um, it says if you add more resistors in series, increases the resistance. Uh, this product over the sum, I mean, you can do this. I, I, it's not one of my faves, but um, so what it basically is saying is that if you're looking at um, resistors in in uh, parallel, you can do R1 times R2 over R1 plus R2, and that gives you the um, total resistance, but it's just a silly little thing. I mean, it works, so you could do it. Um, same thing for capacitors that are in series. It's just that one over R rule. Um, it's just the way the math works out. And then um, circuits with parallel plate capacitors are on the exam, but you don't have to worry about RC circuits, so you're not going to... They say you don't have to worry about RC circuits, but then they'll put a resistor and a capacitor together, but like I said, they make it so it's pretty obvious it either goes through it or doesn't go through it. Um, and then we already said ammeters are connected in series and voltmeters are in parallel. Let's just do ourselves. Okay, magnetism, we're almost there. So magnetism where it gets really weird and strange. Um, but remember, the math was really easy for it. So if we're looking at the force um, from a B field, remember it's equal to QVB. Um, that's a cross product. That's what it's showing right here is that that's a cross product. Um, but that's why we take the sine of the sine of theta. But in reality, I hardly ever see them where you have to do the angle. You just want the perpendicular component. Right? So if I know that it's moving in this direction and the B field is in that direction, I just want the component of the B field that is perpendicular to the velocity, right? So depending on what angle they give, you know, you want like, make that dashed, right? You want that component of the B field, or you could look at, I want that component of the velocity, whichever way you want to go, as long as they're perpendicular, right? That's the point, is that remember Q. Um, that V and B and F are all perpendicular to each other. That's why it's a cross product. Same thing for BIL. That's just for, so this is Q, right, is for a charge, right? So that's for a single charge, and this one is for a wire. Um, 
the magnetic field around a wire is mu naught i over 2 pi r. So remember, if I have a wire that looks like that, that the B field, and I take my, my, my thumb, right, and I point it, my fingers are going to curve like that, and that's the B field. And so this r is the distance from the wire, from wire, right, from wire. Um, and so the further out you get, the less you have. Mu naught is a, is a constant. Um, if we're looking at magnetic flux, it's BA cosine phi. So I'm always looking at it because, you know, the phi looks like that and the theta looks like that. So this one's, the angle you're finding is from here, right? You're trying to get the perpendicular. As opposed to this one, it's the angle from the perpendicular. So you're, remember, this is the weird one. And so if if it's like this, then then phi is equal to um, zero, and if, right, if it's pointing like that, then phi is equal to 90, so I find that confusing, but it sometimes helps me if I think about the way the phi looks, and then EMF is just simply BVL, um, but it's also N times the delta phi over T, so the, the idea is you can't have an EMF, an electromagnetic force, unless there is a change in the magnetic flux, remember magnetic flux is kind of like the density, right, it's the B times A, um, the cosine phi is there, I know, but it's really, you're looking at how many B lines are going through an area, so here's my area, and here are my B lines, and so the more bees I have, the more flux I have. If I change, you know, if I rotate this thing around or something, I can change how many are going through. And it's only the perpendicular parts that I worry about. Um, so if I rotate this thing, you know, in this direction, right, along the plane, then there's no change. Um, but if I rotate it up and down, I know it's hard to see on my drawing, but, you know, if I rotate it this way and the bee feels pointing this way, now I have a change um, in flux. Yeah? Um, things to remember? Um, is that when we're doing our right hand rule, our thumb is I or positive Q, our fingers are B, and our palm is F. Let's see if I can draw a hand. So here's my hand, right? And so we have F is the slap. That's the way I always look at it. B field is um, your uh, magnetic field, right? Your fingers. Oh, that looks really bad because my my palm needs to be coming out at me, right? And so if we make this better, so really I should have drawn the force kind of going like this is coming out you at your face. And then, yeah, it looks really bad when it's not three dimensions. And then your Q or your I, remember this has to be a positive Q or positive I. And then it's, <laughs> that's my left hand, isn't it guys? Well, okay. So if we do it this way, because that's the way my hand that looks like my left hand, doesn't it, with the way my fingers are and my palm is coming out? So if that was my left hand, we would know that that would not be I. That would be, right, that would be a negative Q because that's my left hand, right? If I could draw it right in my right hand, the force would be going the other way, right, if it was my right hand, right? So depending on which way you're going, and then that would be for a positive Q. So pay attention or a positive I. So pay attention to which one it is. Um, the magnitude of the force uses only the perpendicular components, right? So we only care about the perpendicular parts of it. Um, if it's parallel, then there's no force. Um, a charged particle that's not moving has no force. And when a particle is negative, you simply switch your hand, right? We got Things also to remember is that FB is always perpendicular, which means no work can be done, so there's no change in kinetic energy or no V. It can only turn and make a circle, um, so you can't do anything else with a B field. You cannot make it go faster. You cannot make it go faster, right? It can be centripetal force. Centripetal force cannot make things go faster, so it's the same kind of concept. Uh, for right-hand rule number two, that's when we're trying to figure out which way it goes. So if I have my current going like this and I use my right hand, then I know that the B field is going like that. So it's like that curving. I don't know if I can draw this. Here's my thumb, and then my fingers kind of curve. Okay, I'm not very good at drawing. And here are my fingers. Yes, sure. Those are supposed to be a hand. Okay, it doesn't look like a hand, but you got the idea, right? So your fingers go up and over the top. Um, if we're dealing with um, 
a solenoid. Remember, so a solenoid is when you have lots of wires going like this. Now you grab it with the same lovely looking hand, and my thumb is pointing this way, so this would be my north pole because that's the way my thumb is pointing, and my current now is going up and over the way my fingers are going. So you can figure out which way is north and which way is south that way for a solenoid. Last thing, magnetic flux. Oh, we already said this. Density of the magnetic field, EMF needs a change in magnetic flux, so it opposes motion. Okay, we need to talk about this because this is that hard part. Um, so it, remember what we said is that if I have um, a north and south and I bring something in a solenoid or something, I don't know what it is, and if it's moving like this, it's going to induce a field in it such that it opposes the motion. So this is going to become a north pole because it's going to try to push it away. If that's a north pole, my fingers should go over the top, so then the main current would be going like this. But if I take that same situation and I make this south and north, and here's my solenoid, but now I'm going to move it in the other way. So now this is going to become a south, my finger points the other way. So now the current is going to go in that direction. So you have to figure out which one's south, which one's north, which way the current goes. But remember the, the mantra is it opposes motion. So whatever you're doing, it has to change um, it has to oppose what's going on, so the north and the south kind of thing. Um, for the right-hand rule, fingers are the permanent beam, uh, field causing induction. I is the current flowing through the conductor, and palm is the opposite force. So the way that one could work is lots of times they have like a rail or something like this, right? And then maybe you have a B field um, that is going into the page. And so if it's moving as a velocity going in that direction, then we know the force is going to be going in that direction. So then if I use my right hand rule and I have my palm, my fingers will be pointing into the page and my palm will be pointing out, then I know that my current is going to be going up. And so I can say, oh, my current's going to go like this and it's going to keep looping around because it's, it's, it's moving as it's going. Remember, it's kind of like free fall is the fact that you're going to get more and more force because it's going to go, um, you're going to make it start and then it's going to go, it's going to accelerate because of the force to begin with. This is from the induced current, remember? This is not what was causing it to move in the first place. Um, if you had current, it would make it move a different way, right? But if we're talking about um, induction, it opposes the motion, so eventually it would be like it would reach terminal velocity and it would, it would stop. So what happens sometimes is you have current going in it and then that makes it move and then you have the induced one that makes it go the other way, right? I hope that makes sense, right? So let me, let me make sure I clarify this. So if I have something and let's say there's a wire and it's connected to a battery or something like that. So there's current already flowing in it and then let's say in here you have a B field pointing out of the page. So now I look at the force caused by the external B field. So my um, thumb goes up, my fingers go um, out of the page. And so there's a force, assuming this thing can move, right? So it's going to have a force going in that direction. But because it's moving in that direction, it's going to induce another current going this way, which is going to cause a force going in the opposite way. And so as those two forces go, right, this is going to make it go faster and faster, right, over here. And then this force and this force eventually are going to become equal, and so it'll reach a constant velocity, right? So that's kind of the concept. I, I always look at it as, like, falling, right? When you fall, you start falling faster due to gravity, so you accelerate, and then eventually you reach terminal velocity. So it's the same kind of concept. All right, that's it.